This was the first horror game ever made. The game's called Haunted House for the Atari, and if you can believe it, this was terrifying back in 1982. You take on the role of a pair of disembodied eyes navigating a four-story house in complete darkness, illuminated only by the box matches you've brought with you. Reminder back in 1982, the idea of a cell phone flashlight, not yet invented, but this is no ordinary house. No, this house is haunted. Yeah. It's haunted by the ghost of Zachary Graves and occupied by several tarantulas and one bat. You need to collect three pieces of Zachary's urn before you escape, before you are scared to death. That's actually literally what the game calls it. It's kind of hilarious. And by today's standards, Haunted House is almost laughable. But the game was the first of its kind and whether intentional or not, it opened the floodgates for the horror genre of video games as we know it today. Games like these have been the subject of nightmares in kids and adults for decades. And if you've ever played a horror game before, you know exactly how visceral that experience can be. But have you ever wondered why we play horror games? What is it about being paralyzingly afraid that keeps us coming back to the genre? And why is it that some of us enjoy horror while others despise it? This is a video about the games that keep us up at night and what they can teach us about ourselves. Wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ashes. The first horror game I ever played was this one. That's right, my first step into horror, like many of you, was actually an accident. That's the old passage to Ravenholm. We don't go there anymore. No one warned me that my journey in Half-Life 2 would end at the entrance to Ravenholm. While the game isn't strictly part of the horror genre, this chapter of the game was the first major shift in tone from cautiously optimistic hero to the morose. Half of a dead body swings from a tree in the courtyard out front. Mindless zombies shamble out from behind dark corners. The voice of a lunatic echoes through the town's streets. The bodies of my brothers and sisters of the railroad were taken over by those, those things. Ravenholm was a dramatic depiction of the horrors of war. Because I was 10 years old when I played and wholly unprepared to face it, I was horrified. So I shut down the computer and I stepped away for a while. I was too afraid to continue playing. But I didn't go back to finish Half-Life 2. And my fear of Ravenholm didn't end when I shut my computer off. Scenes from the game were played in my mind over and over again. In dreams, I would find myself cornered by my head-crabbed friends or surrounded by walls of fire and mangled corpses. I would wake up in a cold sweat from nightmares and then be expected to just go about my day like nothing was wrong. Over the next several weeks, the trauma of only a few minutes of gameplay continued to haunt me. My imagination was working in overdrive. It was creating new scenarios that I never encountered in the game until the point where the idea of Ravenholm became worse than Ravenholm itself. I have a fear of jumping. Heights themselves don't bother me very much, but the idea of jumping off of a tall bridge or out of a plane, it causes my heart to sink into my stomach. It's a fear that I've had most of my life and one that I fortunately don't have to face all that often. But a few years ago, I went on vacation with my girlfriend to Croatia. And while we were there, one day we signed up for a canyoning adventure trip. We spent the afternoon descending down the canyon's walls into the river below, then peacefully floating down the river toward the mouth of the canyon. Peacefully, that is, until we came to a cliffside about uh, 40 feet up or so, where we had to jump off into the water below. I had been dreading this part of the trip. Our guides had warned us that it was going to be coming, and the fear of the jump was really the only thing that I could think about at the time. It meant that I had to face one of my biggest fears, facing the topic of countless nightmares that I had had previous night after night. The idea of jumping into the abyss. Facing that in front of a group of strangers who did not know me, and I felt wholly unprepared. 
Luckily, when we reached the cliff, I learned that I had another option. I could climb down into the water instead of jumping, and I could leave facing my fears for another day when I was ready for it. Back to 2004, in a moment, I realized that I had already experienced Ravenholm. In my nightmares, it had consumed me. I had lived it over and over and over again, each time more terrifying than the last. Realizing that, what harm would it be to experience it one more time? So I booted up Half-Life 2 again, I reloaded my save, and I found myself there in the courtyard. But it wasn't as I first remembered it. The head crabs, the zombies, the eerie voices were all still there, sure, well done, but they all had less of an edge to them. I had already been through so much worse in my mind that the game seemed almost like a parody of my own memories. Games keep us up at night, processing our experience in them. In dreams and in nightmares, our brains are analyzing the elements of stories and challenges that we faced. In fact, some researchers believe that dreams act as a rehearsal for the skills and encounters we might have in the future, so that in the morning, when we wake up, we're able to approach difficult tasks with a new perspective. We can laugh at the things that once scared us. We can take on that difficult boss fight with renewed determination. The nightmares I had endured about Ravenholm helped me to go back and face it with a new sense of resolve. And because of that, I was able to enjoy the rest of what is an amazing game, one of the classics. I wasn't prepared for Ravenholm. It was an accident forced on me by circumstance, and I hadn't signed up to play a horror game when I first got my hands on Half-Life 2. But many people do enjoy horror. We seem hardwired to seek out new experiences. Maybe that's watching a scary movie or visiting a haunted house or simply doing something that forces us to face our fears. But why? If games are supposed to be enjoyable, why do we play games that make us feel so afraid? This is something that psychologists have been trying to understand for decades now. And there's actually a surprising amount of research that seeks to explain why we enjoy horror. While I was sitting down to research the topic myself, one name came up time and time and time again, Marvin Zuckerman. He's a researcher and professor of psychology whose entire body of research focuses on answering the question, why do we do what we do? In like everything. Zuckerman penned a concept known as sensation seeking. It's a trait found in all of us, though varying in different levels individually and throughout our lives and it dictates how willing we are to make decisions that might lead to intense sensations and experiences. In the context of horror, those with a high sensation-seeking trait are more likely to enjoy horror games and movies because of the feelings of tension and heightened sensitivity that these games create in us. Whereas those with a low sensation-seeking trait might avoid games like these. In his research, Zuckerman found that sensation-seeking often peaks in our teenage years and declines after that, so it's far more likely for someone to first enjoy horror as a young teenager than it is to first enjoy it in your late 30s, for instance. But sensation-seeking alone doesn't answer why we might turn to horror games for enjoyment when there are thousands of other options available to us. For that, there's another concept in human psychology proposed in a study published in 2010. It's known as productivity orientation. It's the idea that we enjoy feeling productive and accomplished, and so we tend to make decisions that lead to those feelings of productivity and accomplishment. This might describe why we feel bored if our lives aren't changing very much in any meaningful way, and also describes feelings of reduced self-worth, self-esteem, and mental health when it feels like we're doing the same thing every day. We only live so long, and there is so much world out there for us to experience. So when we feel like we're making progress on a project or in our career, we're feeding that productivity orientation inside ourselves. The study's researchers theorize that this also drives our desire for unique or exotic experiences, that those with a strong productivity orientation might choose to vacation, say, in Japan instead of Iowa, or visit a new restaurant instead of ordering in food again from Pizza Hut, or playing a new horror game instead of replaying the KFC dating simulator and getting blue-balled by Colonel Sanders for the fifth time. Come on, please that in the same way that productivity at work increases our self-worth, our self-esteem, and our mental health, so too does productivity 
in choosing a variety of life experiences. And if that's true, it means that for some people, quite literally, experiencing a variety of games actually works to improve their own lives, not just through the skills that you build in video games like critical thinking and puzzle solving, but also through personal values like building confidence and courage. Rewatching the video of our canyoning trip, there's a moment when I realize just how close I am to my fear of jumping. When faced with frightening scenes, our bodies react instinctually. We tense up, we, we cover our eyes, we take a step backwards in preparation to literally run away. The height was nothing, but the jump, the idea of the jump was terrifying. What if I slipped? What if I hit the bottom of the river? What if I became the first person to belly flop and die on that river? Someone would have to update the Wikipedia page after I was gone. While our bodies are physically coping, our minds are racing with thoughts and fears. But one of the first questions that comes to mind when we're face to face with our nightmares is, why am I doing this? Why should I jump off this cliff? Why am I standing so close to this spider? Why shouldn't I just run away? What we don't often consider is how facing our fears might change us for the better. Before Ravenholm, I knew myself as a person who was too afraid to challenge a horror game. I was pretty terrified just by the box art of horror games alone. But after Ravenholm, I was someone who had proved that they could overcome frightening circumstances. I had conquered my fear of fear. And in that way, games really had changed my life, really had taught me about my own values. I came to view myself as someone who was courageous. And that courage became a value that was important to me and that I carried with me for the rest of my life. But let me tell you, the limits of that courage are constantly being tested as game developers innovate in the horror genre. Games have come a long way since Haunted House, even since Half-Life 2. And the idea of true horror is constantly being redefined. Today, we look at games like the original Silent Hill on PS1 and we laugh rather than feel afraid because a game's atmosphere has become one of the most important elements in modern gaming. Where once we could kind of look past Harry's awkward running animation and the game's outrageous use of fog culling, the game now falls in a new category of horror has-beens, a B-movie memory of what horror used to be. Modern horror now takes many forms, from the claustrophobic hallways of the Ishimura to the repulsive woodlands in Darkwood. But one important thread is woven into any great horror game, immersion. Horror is most effective when we forget that we're playing a game, when everything we hear and see feels real. And that's largely accomplished through the use of sound and consistent visual design. The game Little Nightmares 2 was an incredible example of this. A game that from the outside doesn't really appear to be horrifying was truly horrifying. As you make your way through a twisted world that was never designed for you, the game's environments appear both alien and familiar. You've probably visited a city before, but when it stands larger than life over you, it almost loses its shape becomes something so oppressive that your perception of cities out in the real world might even be changed by it. Add to it the game's use of audio and dynamism as a story device, and it gets even more incredible. The creaking of a wood chair, the frantic scribbling of a pencil on paper, the sound of stretching rubber, a dissonant chorus of notes as you move closer to your goal. All of these are drowning out the sounds of your tiny movements, your steady, labored heartbeat. Sometimes it's difficult to pin down why one game feels horrifying while another feels almost comical. And immersion is truly that line that separates them. Little Nightmare's use of sound and scale is gut-wrenching, and it turns the mundane into something menacing. And the experience from beginning to end makes you feel like nowhere is safe. And that's not a good feeling. I could be planting money trees on my private island. Why am I instead choosing to flee for my life from sadistic adults who literally want to kill me? I think it's because through all of my experiences in horror, I come out on the other side having learned something more about myself. 
Nightmares challenge our identities. When we wake up, our first question is to ask ourselves, why did we dream that? What does it mean? And they offer us an opportunity for self-reflection as well. I thought I was someone who would be content playing the same game for years and years, but it turns out I'd love to experience a wide variety of games. I thought I was someone who would never have the determination to finish a horror game, but games taught me that that wasn't true. I thought I was someone who wouldn't have the courage to jump into the water. And, well. Just walk right off, Max. How about you?